Greetings, citizens, and welcome to Unknown. I'm Jason McClellan. Shane Hurd and Maureen Ellsbury are in the house today. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be discussing yet another episode of History's Project Blue Book today. But first, it's time for announcements. Maureen Ellsbury and I are presenting a panel at Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle, Washington on Friday, March 15th, titled Real Life X-Files, Strange Stories of Real Paranormal Investigations. And that event runs from March 14th through the 17th at the Washington State Convention Center. All the information for that event is at emeraldcitycomiccon.com. That event is like right here, Maureen. I'm super stoked for it. I know. I can't believe it's coming up in just a few days. Yep. And like we said before, I mean, neither of us have spoken in Seattle. So this is going to be super exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I was actually just sitting next to some girls having lunch uh, at... A, a bar and they were talking about comic-con non-stop and she was wearing a nasa sweatshirt and i was so tempted to be like excuse me <laughs> couldn't help but over here yeah you should come to our panel friday night Damn but right. i held back ah uh, that's all right yeah yeah it's it's right around the corner um we still putting the final touches on it but it is going to be fun we've done a, a similar panel before so much fun to talk about this topic and certainly to the comic-con crowd so looking forward to it hope to see some of you at emerald city comic-con then uh if you'll be in the phoenix area same weekend really same in the phoenix area on march 17th the 22nd Phoenix Lights Anniversary Celebration is taking place at the Scottsdale Harkin Shea 14 Cinema. This event sells out every year, so if you're interested, grab your tickets now. For more information about that event, go to thephoenixlights.net. Shane Hurd and I will be at UFO Megacon in Laughlin, Nevada on March 30th. That's the final day of the event, I believe. That is a super long event with tons of speakers. It runs from March 24th through the 30th. Um, so check out ufomegacon.com for the information on that event. Again, Shane and I will be there only on March 30th, but do check out the website for the full schedule for that event to see when you want to attend that one. Then June 21st through the 23rd, Ryan Sprague and I will be speaking at Alien Con in Los Angeles, California. There might be some special Rogue Planet shenanigans happening there with Shane and Maureen too. And that event is creeping up faster than I would like it to, but I'm super excited about it. So we'll start start talking about uh, more details with that one soon. But go to thealiencon.com for that event's details and you can grab tickets there too. And Ryan Sprague will be presenting at Michigan UFO Contact, September 20th and 21st in Houghton Lake, Michigan. MIUFOCON.com is the website for that event. So look there for details. Also look on Facebook for Michigan UFO Contact for the most up-to-date information on that event. So those are the announcements we have for today. So with those out of the way, let's get into this week's Project Blue Book discussion. If you haven't seen it yet... Or if you're not familiar with this show, Project Blue Book is a dramatic series on the History Channel. It's a fictional series, and it's based on the United States Air Force's real-life UFO study, the official UFO study, that ran from 1952 through 1969. Now, although the show is fictional, it draws on real Project Blue Book cases and other elements from UFO history and UFO lore, using those for inspiration. We're talking about Episode 9 today an episode titled Abduction. And as we like to do on this show, before talking about the episode itself, we'll do a quick run-through of the real inspiration behind the latest episode of Project Blue Book. And the inspiration used for the plot of episode 8 was, as surprising as it might be, the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case of 1961. So Maureen is going to give us a quick overview of that case. Maureen? Yeah, let's call this the cliff notes of this case. (laughs) Obviously, this is one of the most famous alleged abductions in all of history. Uh, What happened was in 1961, I'm going to mention this solely because this was a huge 
uh, portion of why this received a lot of attention. Not only was it one of the first widely reported alleged abductions, but it was also from an interracial couple in the 1960s. So that's big news at that time. These were both mm-hmm. very um, strong civil advocates. And um, I don't know, this is a complicated case. There's a lot of details And I know a lot of people that we know are very versed on this. So forgive me for just covering the basics to start this off with. Uh, Basically, this couple had gotten married. They were on a delayed honeymoon. It had been about a, a year and a half, maybe. They lived in New Hampshire, and they decided to take this quick little uh, late honeymoon to Niagara Falls and then to Montreal. On their way back... They were supposed to stay there last night in Montreal, but they couldn't find a hotel that would take their dog. So, and they were having trouble finding their way because they were having trouble reading the French language signs. Uh, so they decided to head home. There was a tropical storm coming. They were like, we have to drive all night because we need to beat the storm. Barney, oh, so I should say Betty and Barney Hill. Um, Barney was... A, he worked for the post office and Betty was working, I think, as a, what was she, a social worker? Something similar. And anyways, Barney worked the night shift, so he was very versed on driving late. He felt confident he could do it. Uh, they headed back and Betty spotted this, what she thought was a falling star, I believe, at first. And then it started moving erratically and it seemed to be kind of following them. They stopped a few times and finally... The last time they remember really stopping, they saw it descended like to 100 feet uh, within the range of the ground and where they were at. And they jumped out and Barney went over to the field to look at this object with binoculars. It was uh, a silver saucer shape that had a huge panel of windows. And he uh, supposedly saw figures in it that he thought were of non-terrestrial nature he gets scared he has the immense feeling that they're going to be captured so he runs back says betty get back in the car let's go and then they find themselves about 35 miles down the road they don't remember really what was happening they're not where they should be uh they were remember encountering a roadblock They finally, they just keep driving home and they get there a couple hours later than they should have. So they have about two hours of missing time. They know something weird happened. They remember seeing something. They remember driving down the road and having the trunk of the car, like hearing a buzzing noise and feeling pulsating. Uh, No idea what it was. This happened twice. They felt very strongly that something happened to where they were maybe exposed to extreme radiation. So they took their clothes off outside, I think. They took showers. They called Betty's younger sister, who actually is the mother of uh, a colleague we all know, Kathleen Martin, who is very prominent in the UFO field and is Betty's niece. Um, So... They were saying all this happened. I think they got the advice of a neighbor to go take a compass outside and test to see um, whether there was some weird electromagnetic effects happening on the trunk of the car. And indeed, they found this counter-rotating magnetic fields right where the buzzing was going on. Uh, Betty's dress was all torn up and they couldn't figure out why this had happened. Um, there was a bunch of other stuff going on and uh, Barney's binocular strap was broken. Their watches had stopped, weren't running. They had no idea what was going on. So what they did was they reported this to Project Blue Book. But in that case, Barney left out the fact that uh, what they had seen was beans of a extraterrestrial possible nature. Uh, he was afraid of ridicule. So they also reported it to NICAP though. Um, and which is the national investigations committee on aerial phenomena. He told them, of course, about the non-terrestrial figures because that's less of a taboo thing to do. So anyways, 
this is all kind of hush hush. It's been reported. The family knows about it. Betty's torn up dress is hanging in their closet uh, for years until uh, they decide to go through. Betty's having all these terrible nightmares uh, about a similar situation. So they end up going to see this renowned psychiatrist who had been dealing with World War II uh, veterans. And uh, he does hypnosis on them. Uh, His name was Dr. Benjamin Simon. And he thought their trauma was as bad as shell-shocked veterans. So something major happened to them, but they can't really recall this. So he worked with both of them for six months and at the end of each session, and this was separately, like he would he would interview them separately and not tell them what was going on. And then at the end of each session, he allegedly uh, induced amnesia so they wouldn't be able to talk about it. So lots of weird stuff going on. There's uh, chemical analysis finally happens on Betty and Barney's dresses. And, okay, I just noticed that I said Betty and Barney's dresses. Only Betty was wearing a dress. I will tell you that right now. (laughs) 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 I'm talking too fast is my problem. So anyways, we, we have a case where we have these credible people. They've had missing time. There's some scientific evidence to suggest that something weird happened to them. They feared for their lives. Um, Basically, the results of what happened under hypnosis was that they saw figures in the road. They were somehow turned down this dirt road. They got out. um, Their toes were dragging across the ground, which is kind of funny because if anybody's been watching um, the new Roswell, New Mexico show, I have just because of Ryan, (laughs) basically Um, it, the, teeny bopper drama reboot. Um, there is a lot of scenes of people across the desert with their toes, just dragging cause they're being pulled. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, they went up a ramp into this examination room. They were separated. There were short, what we would call the usual grays, you know, large head, big eyes, skinny bodies, short, uh, beans that were doing tests on them. And they felt like, they were trying to determine uh, how they were different from us, basically. So very interested in the skin and joints, uh, skeletal system, the whole works. So um, one of the interesting things a lot of people will tell you about is that they seem to be doing tests that we were not aware of at the time, like tests on Betty um, using a needle through her navel, trying to figure out whether she was pregnant, et cetera. Um, they remember all this weird stuff. They were being uh, spoken to telepathically in English. Then it comes out that Betty has received some sort of, like when asking where are you from, has received some idea of a star map. So, um, after she draws this, do you guys remember Marjorie who, uh, did this 3d star maps fish? Yeah. Fish. fish. Oh, fisk. Okay. Yeah. Fish. Yeah. Marjorie fish that uh, took these drawings basically that Betty did and tried to create a 3d system, uh, 3d example of what this could be and try to figure out the star system. And at the time it took a long time, but, uh, they come up saying, oh, yeah, this is Zeta Reticulus star system in the southern hemisphere, these sun-like stars. Betty was also shown all these symbols on a, what they described as like a tablet, so like an iPad, basically, but in the 60s. Now, one important thing to note is that all of this stuff happened a couple of years after the actual event, um, and it wasn't until like four or five years later when the story went public. And this is because there was some breach in confidentiality. Um, And this is important, obviously, to recall because they had, yes, reported this officially to Project Blue Book and to NICAP, but they didn't want this to be public because they felt they had too much to lose. So 
they had um, no, it wasn't like they were searching for fame or, or something to be the most famous couple ever. But um, once the news did leak out, they kind of decided, okay, well, we're going to just go public and, and talk about it. We'll let them write the book. We'll do this. I don't know how much more to get into. There's a lot of weird stuff with like a couple years later when they dragged Betty's dress out, there was weird pink powder that blew away that, you know, skeptics will tell you uh, likely was maybe just laundry detergent or something. Um, It's very, very, very confusing. There's a lot of weird details. I won't even get into the weird Stan Romanek bullshit. That's not true that... (laughs) Do you I remember think, that, I Jason? Th- yeah. And I think we have certainly more than enough, you know, for the the discussion going into Project Blue Book, because sure. we've really, really heard, uh, you know, everything that, that sort of would have been covered um, in what we saw. So I guess I overkilled my cliff notes. <laughs> no, no, that's wonderful. And like you said, it's a very complex case. There's a lot to it. Um, certainly a lot to talk about and we'll guaranteed be talking about it again on this show. But let's shift now into talking about the episode of Project Blue Book. And Shane, what did you think of this episode called Abduction and knowing that they used this case as inspiration? um, What did you think of the episode? Uh, Again, from the perspective that this is a fictional representation of some real life events, um, I thought it was, you know, well done and interesting and compelling and all those things. I mean, there were there were definitely facets of the uh, the Hill case incorporated incorporated in it. You know, happened in New Hampshire. Uh, they were hypnotized. There was the star chart, and of course, it just being an abduction and those things, you know, could were pretty vague really and weren't really directly related. I think to the Hill case very much. However, you know, the show, it's moving the show along. Um, I really like the, um, it, well, I kind of don't like what's happening with Mimi and Susie and that whole thing has bothered me a little bit, but, um, you know, not too much of a spoiler here, but she, Susie, uh, took care of her handler, which I think is a good thing. And, uh, she seems to have a heart towards, uh, towards Heineck. So that's a good thing. Um, one thing I thought was kind of cool that they did in the show that, you know, normally when people talk about the close encounter scale, you know, CE one, two and three, um, they really don't focus on the fact that a CE one is a sighting within 500 feet. Right. And that's of and, and the point behind that on Heinex part was if you've seen something within 500 feet, you should see enough detail to discern, you know, what it is and what it is not. And then when you graduate to a two, it's also a sighting within 500 feet. Uh, but this this includes some kind of physical effect. And then ultimately he he had the CE3, which was, again, something within 500 feet. You've seen the craft, but you've also seen beings. And so then later, I think CE4 and 5 and those things were added by other individuals. But I thought it was kind of cool that they touched on that because even, you know, in our community and stuff, you don't hear a lot of people, you know, acknowledge that. that it's really based on the footage so that he, he could, you know, you could have a, you know, a more verifiable account or sighting. Yeah. So I thought that was cool that they did that. What about you, Maureen? What did you think of the episode? Well, this one was a bit of a stretch, but, you know, um, as we know, this is fiction. Um, It is certainly causing a lot of uproar within people closely related to the Betty and Barney Hill case. Um, Kathleen Martin was uh, talking about, oh, God, I wish I remembered the words she used on Facebook, something about like utter malarkey or something. (laughs) Um, And, you know, obviously Bryce Sable as well, who actually owns now the, the TV rights for, um, captured the Mm -hmm. book by Stanton Friedman and Kathleen Martin on the Betty and Barney Hill abduction. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see everyone's backlash again. This is a fiction show. So very loosely based, we have, um, some of the most important parts of the 
real case that they didn't sort of touch on or they changed into something like a, a crazed lunatic um, mm-hmm. taking people hostage because he's not getting help. And that's very much not what the case was. Um, I think in terms of the whole like uh, the Mimi situation, um, it was basically like this weird date rape seduction thing <laughs> that it was kind of awkward and disturbing mm-hmm. a little bit, but um I know I know Ryan was also up in arms about that. So mm-hmm. um yeah, you know, it's 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 hard to be like, well, they could have pulled a lot of stuff that happened within this case to make it more essential to the storyline and more based on this actual case, for sure. The, I think that the wiggle room was there, that they could have done it. And I'm not really sure why they diverted so much. Yeah. Um, it, I'm going to say it, it wasn't my favorite episode. Uh, and also, we, we, I guess maybe the one thing that I did enjoy was that they brought this, the classification in, you know, yeah. the, this is a, you know, uh, close encounter of the third kind and, mm-hmm. and, and things like that. So now we have Hynix going on his scale. But yeah. other than that, I don't know. I just was kind of like, all right, well, that happened. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, well, you know, it's interesting that, you know, in choosing to use the Hill abduction case as the inspiration for this episode, very little from that case was actually used in the plot. So for me, I mean, I think it would have made more sense for them to just, you know, kind of generally do abductions and, you know, do some other non-identifiable things as the Hill case. Um, And in their post episode educational (laughs) videos and stuff that they put out, you know, kind of show a lot of different abduction stories, not just the Hill um, abduction story saying this was, you know, what inspired this episode. Because the story portrayed deviates so far from it down to the the very basics of the interracial couple, the both of them having experienced the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they did their little cute twists and turns that they do trying to bring in other UFO lore, like instead of it being Zeta Reticuli, it was the Pleiades or whatever they did. Mm -hmm. You know, there were some interesting things like that, but it was so far removed from, from the Hill case that, you know, I I thought it was silly to even, even go there. But as we've mentioned with previous episodes and you brought it up, Maureen, I mean, I think it comes down in a lot of these cases to just rights issues. There are several people who have interests in the Hill's story, you know, Mm -hmm. the rights to that story. And as you said, we know that Bryce Abel has, has certain rights to certainly captured. Um, So I think this is their way of, you know, skirting those issues and, and avoiding any potential legal um, ramifications for getting too close to the real story. But overall, with the the episode itself, I mean, I enjoyed it. Um, like I have with all of these, they all have their issues and certainly deviate pretty darn far from from the actual cases. But you know, I'm fine with that. Yeah, one thing that was. Right, though, too, that that Barney actually had been uh, in the military. He was uh, had all these honorable uh, mentions and everything else. You know, he was actually a part of this sort of section that they portrayed him. However, he was not an unhinged lunatic that needed to attack everyone with with a gun. So, yeah, I thought, too, that um that case is so prominent, you know, and so well known that it it would it would be risky to really even do anything with it because of the fact that there certainly just wouldn't be time to do it justice for one thing. Good but point. I didn't even think of the standpoint that you mentioned, Jason, that, yeah, there certainly could be copyright issues and other legalities that prevented them from um, doing it too closely. So yeah. uh, that that is an interesting side to it. Yeah, for sure. And I think we've seen that, uh, you know, a couple of times with this this series. So as angry as people like to get, you know, I think there are things working behind the scenes that, uh, you know, we're, we're not aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, but as they demonstrate, the, the writers and creators of this show are well aware of the cases 
and they know they know the details and in many of these cases they know a lot of the people involved or associated with these cases and they've done their homework and they've met with these people and have done a really good job of of demonstrating that they know the material but for TV reasons you know a lot of it gets changed and again lots of reasons for that but they can do it. It's their show and it's great entertainment. And hey, as a UFO geek, I'm loving it. Absolutely. And, and you know, if people are interested in actually learning about this case, read Captured. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a very detailed description of the book. Uh, watch. OK, what is the uh, fiction dramatized movie that oh, was the, starring in- James Earl Jones. Yeah, the James Interrupted Earl Jones. Journey. Yes. Interrupted Journey. Thank yeah. you. I, I kept thinking for some reason intercepted, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Interrupted Journey. That's a that's an old uh, coverage of the case in a dramatized version. Um, obviously, don't rely on all your facts mm-hmm. watching that either. But there there is plenty of information on this case that you can get accurate portrayals um carl sagan was not a fan of this case we'll just say that um (laughs) so you you'll find a lot about um sort of credible things about the case and a lot of uh debunking as well so yeah and again we'll we'll cover this case much more uh on a future episode and we'll get we'll get bryce abel on pretty soon to discuss it because i know he's he's rearing to get get in and uh you know, set the set the record straight on this case, and he's got a lot to say about it. So, all right, well, friends, we've just about reached the end of the first season of Project Blue Book. It's down to the final episode. Episode ten airs on March twelfth, and the title of that episode is "The Washington Merry Go Round." So. We're excited Uh-oh. to see what's up with that to wrap up this season. And uh, yeah, say, say goodbye for a little while for Project Blue Book. Well, citizens, as we wrap up this episode, we invite you to come join us in the Rogue Planet Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Rogue Planet. And let us know what you thought of the latest episode of Project Blue Book or anything else UFO related that's on your mind. And please always feel free to reach out to us if you have questions. If you want to share a UFO experience you've had or anything else, we're all over social media. We have a contact form on the website, or you can always email us at contact at rogueplanet.tv. You can find more episodes of Unknown on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, and yes, even YouTube. Subscribe on your favorite podcast provider so you're notified when we publish new episodes. And we'd appreciate it if you would rate and review Unknown on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps the show get more exposure. And so does sharing the show with your friends. That's the small favor we're asking you. Post these episodes all over social media and help introduce new people to Unknown. You can always find this show at RoguePlanet.tv because Unknown is a Rogue Planet production. RoguePlanet.tv is your home for all the strange. Big thanks to our talented friend and fellow Rogue Planeteer Caleb Hanks for the show's intro and outro music. Check out all his work at TheClerkChronicles.com. Thanks again for hanging out with us today. I'm Jason McClellan. I'm Shane Hurd. And I'm Marine Elsberry. <laughs> <laughs> do us a favor friends always treat the ufo subject with the cautious and responsible skepticism it deserves question everything have the courage to form your own opinions keep truth as the focus of your quest even if the truth conflicts with your opinions and of course stay strange stay strange